good afternoon. Welcome to Sociology One. So uh, hope we're all uh, caught up. Make sure you look at the portal, I'm sorry, at the um, Canvas site. I've uploaded the lecture notes, most of them, and the study guide. And I think I gave us the date of our exam on there. So you should all know when and where to be for that. And uh, uh, so we're not going to be able to cover chapter 20 on globalization, on global issues, but we will be talking about urban issues this week. And I'll have more lecture notes and a few more study questions by the end of this week for you to include. Um, and I think I will have an essay question again. I'm not sure what that'll be, but I will, uh, I think it might be just one I have you write on during the exam. So whip out a piece of paper and do a handwritten uh, essay question. So we'll probably do something like that, but I'll let you know about that too by the end of the week. All right, so we were just finishing up with education issues. We're just on the last one. And remember, we were talking about Traub, what no school can do. And just to uh, remind you of his basic idea here, it's that uh, it's the idea that uh, school reform needs to go beyond just reforming schools, that we've talked a lot about the problems that our schools have. But if we really want to fix them, um, we probably need to do more than just fixing the schools. And, uh, and so IMPACT was a program that we said works. It was a program that is like a social service agency located on a school grounds that had you know, uh, services for families, like literacy programs to help you read to your kids so the adults can learn English and learn to read better. Um, count, you know, uh, family planning so people can limit the number of children they have or plan them at the right time. Nutrition services, daycare, uh, a medical clinic. These are all things that help families function better so that the kids can function better in school. And it works. In other words, the schools did better and the students did better when they had these kinds of services available. And Trav asks, well, if it works, why aren't we doing more of this around the country? And he brings up political resistance. Conservatives, did I already talk about this, the political resistance? No? So conservatives, on the one hand, would be uh, have resisted programs like this, and they generally do because they say, well, there's too much taxes. It's taxes, it's money, and uh, they would say, well, we don't have that much, you know, we can't keep going into debt as a culture, uh, paying for things. Yes? Well, I, think, I think you already talked about the political system. Oh, I did do, do yeah. it? You talked about conservatives, but not the liberals. Oh, not the liberals. Okay, so what about liberals? So they talk about taxes and they talk about personal responsibility. Why not, you know, take care of yourself? If you want to learn English, go learn English. If you want to eat right, you should do that. But don't expect the taxpayer to pay for that. Liberals, on the other hand, also surprisingly have resisted programs like Impact. And I say surprisingly because they have been willing to use tax money to redistribute it, it's called. You know, you have some wealthy people over here, poor people over here. Redistribute a little of that wealth, and hopefully we're more equal and healthy as a society. But even liberals have been a little opposed to impact our programs like it. One is the idea that it's uh, maybe too much of a band-aid. Meaning it doesn't go far enough. A band-aid, you just kind of put it on to help heal a little bit, but it doesn't really solve your illness. And in this case, uh, many, some liberals would say, well, helping a few poor people do better, like feed their kids better or read to their kids more, that might help a few of those poor people, but it's not getting rid of poverty. In other words, poverty itself is a structural problem, meaning we don't have enough good jobs that pay enough people enough money to be able to be out of poverty. So if we as a society have, you know, this many people and not, and not enough jobs, we're gonna have some people in poverty, so it doesn't necessarily help, I mean, it helps a little bit to help a few people get out of poverty, but some liberals would say, helping people do better in school doesn't really help the society in the long run because if we don't have enough good jobs for people in the middle class, then all the schooling in the world isn't gonna make those jobs happen. So, um, so it isn't just schooling, it's changing the structure of our society so we have more jobs for more people that pay well. And they might also say that it's paternalistic, meaning government acting like daddy, government acting like your mom. And um, 
Con liberals sometimes, I mean, remember the term liberal comes from the word liberty, and so liberals, generally speaking, have been the ones in our society who have said personal freedom is sometimes more important than, you know, other things. So, for example, if a, woman, if a person wants to be gay, they should be allowed to do that. If a person wants to use drugs, they should be able to do that. If a woman wants to get an abortion, she should be able to do that. And so liberals generally have been more in favor of individual freedom. I know that nowadays conservatives say they're the ones that support individual freedom, but it's a little confusing. But one thing liberals have often been against is when the government tries to tell women especially how to raise their children. For example, if you have a nutritionist coming and telling a Latina woman, well, you're feeding your child rice and beans. And that's not healthy. Your child's not going to be healthy. You need to give your child quinoa and kale and, you know, whole grains and stuff like that. Well, you know, that's how her mom fed her and her grandma and that's her culture. And so to have some, you know, middle class white social worker telling a poor non-white woman that she's not a good mom or she's not feeding her children right, it's, uh, you know, it's not always the right way to approach things. And it's sort of like the government is telling poor women that they're not good moms and that we, the government, can raise your child better than you can. And so some liberals have been opposed to programs that are too kind of in the face or intervening in people's families and telling them how to do things in their family. And so some liberals would say, you know, a program like this is too involved in people's family lives. Well, Traub says both of these sides should kind of get over themselves because if you really look at impact, it has something in it that both sides could really embrace. Instead of calling it other people's money, I mean, that's what conservatives say. You're just taking my money to pay for somebody else's problem. And um, Trump doesn't see it that way. He sees this as an investment. Um, yes, it's going to cost money for our society to have more things like impact. But if you invest now in young people's lives in high school, uh, you're actually maybe going to make your country more well off later because, for example, if people don't do well in school, they end up, for example, in prison. Or they end up having babies when they're teenagers. Or they end up being on welfare or other kinds of things. Or they end up being ill, medically ill and stuff. So there's a lot of costs that can come to society if people don't do well in school. So you could sit there and say, well, it's not my job to help these people do well in school. It's not my responsibility. But if you don't want to spend money on other people, you could not spend it now, but then you might be spending it on prisons, on hospitals, on orphanages, on welfare. So maybe it makes sense to spend a little money now on school so you can avoid these much deeper costs later on. And certainly conservatives understand the idea of you invest a little money now to make more money later. So if you could see it in those terms, rather than as you're taking my money and giving it to them, um, you know, maybe people would be more in favor of it. And the reason you're investing is to create personal responsibility. If people can become more successful in school and more able to read to their kids and feed their kids right, and if people can do well in school, then they're going to be responsible for themselves and not depend on the government for welfare or prison or something like that. So it's a smart way to spend the tax money, not a, a waste. And for liberals, uh, Traub would say, well, what's so bad about personal responsibility? I mean, if you don't want the government telling people how to live and being involved in raising their children, well, then what you're saying is you want people to be personally responsible for themselves and take care of themselves. And if that's what you want, then a program like Impact is trying to do that. It's trying to give people the skills and tools they need to be able to take care of themselves and not depend on you know, government support or have government involved in their lives. So really, if you look at it in the way Traub is presenting it as a smart, functionalist move that we need our society to function well and fixing this connection between families and, uh, and schools would help our overall society function better and be a more prosperous, wealthy society. Well, that, if you could see it in those terms, then uh, both conservatives and liberals maybe could get behind it. But we generally fall into these old patterns of just seeing it as conservatives saying, oh, you're just taxing me and spending it on them, and liberals saying, oh, that's just big government telling, you know, big daddy telling 
people what to do, and, uh, but maybe we should begin to change our old story, our old battle, and try to find new ways of solving some of these problems in America. So that's, uh, that's where Traub leaves it, and you can see how his way of looking at it is more like a functionalist, of looking at it as uh, institutions trying to work smoothly together like a machine, and trying to figure out which part of the machine do you need to oil up a little bit, or tweak a little bit, so that the whole machine runs more smoothly. And that's pretty different from the other two uh, perspectives we looked at. All right, well, we've got to move on from schools, and now we're going to be moving into cities. And uh, so I'll just refer to this as, well, we'll just call it cities. And, um, but really, it isn't just about cities. Normally, I would present chapter 19 and chapter 20 kind of together. Chapter 20 is all about global problems. And one of the biggest global problems is, uh, I'm going to call this cities and the environment. Obviously, environmental problems are a big global problem right now. And if you were to read chapter 20, which we're not, I'm not going to require you to do, you'd see that environmental problems are what the book calls manufactured risks, these new things human beings have created that threaten the planet. Um, these are some of the issues that your generation and future generations of humanity are really going to be having to face. Um, I don't know where you stand on global warming. It's a, I don't think it's a controversial topic. I don't, because most scientists and every college and university you go to, scientists who study the issue know that it's going on and that humans created it. The people who say it isn't tend to be businessmen who make money off of the things that cause global warming. So I don't know if you, I don't trust an oil person to tell me that there's no problem with oil. But, um, but anyway, uh, so I'm not even going to entertain the idea that there's no such thing as global warming. It is going on, but we do have a president elect who doesn't believe in it and a party that is in power, the Republicans, who say they don't think there's any such thing as global warming and there's no problem there. But, um, but as your textbook points out, there have been other environmental problems that nobody disputed. For example, the whole ozone hole problem. Um, I don't even know if your generation's aware of that, but before there ever was any global warming or any talk of that when I was in college and before, everyone was worried about the ozone hole, which is a layer of the atmosphere that um, protects us from UV rays, from ultraviolet rays, and certain chemicals we use here on Earth, like CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, mess with the ozone layer, and that was causing ultraviolet rays to come hit planet Earth much more than they should, and lots of skin cancer and other problems because of that. So we as a globe realized we have a hole in our ozone layer and we need to close it up if we don't want all this skin cancer on planet Earth. So the world's countries all got together and they decided to ban CFCs and not allow people to use them in their products and the world's countries agreed to this. And so we don't use CFCs anymore on planet Earth. And the ozone hole is closing back up and we solved that problem. So I kind of want to start with that idea that as a globe we are facing some problems as a globe. Um, and we haven't really had to deal with this as a human race until now. We've dealt with our problems as individual countries or individual communities. But the idea that we are all one human race and we have problems as a group, like the warming of the planet, um, that's a new thing that your generation is dealing with. And the world's countries are going to have to get together to change some things about how they do things socially. And, uh, you know, Chlorofluorocarbons are one. The world's countries got together and said, we don't need those. Those are used for like spray paint and um, aerosol cans, spray cans. And you don't need to use CFCs. There's other chemicals that can be used as propellants. And so the world switched from CFCs to these other propellants. And now we don't have the ozone hole problem. So I do think these global problems are possible to solve. But it takes cooperation and, um, and technological change. But part of the problem is, and the reason cities are connected is, it's also a matter of how we, our lifestyle. So if we were talking about global warming, which we don't get much chance to now because we're not going to talk about chapter 20, but if I was to ask you, well, how many of you drove here in a car all by yourself to school today? Really? Only that many of you? Uh, how many of you came in a car with other people? Some of you. How many walked? How many rode your bike? 
one bike rider, one walker, a couple of carpoolers, but mostly people coming in their car. And if we were going to talk about carbon footprint, I'm sure you've heard the term carbon footprint, but that's the idea that each one of us contributes to global warming with how much carbon we produce. And driving, by the way, is one of the main reasons we have such a big carbon footprint. Now, China right now, if you, the world's leading producers of carbon, world carbon leaders, I guess, um, China now is in the lead. They produce more carbon than we do. But China has a billion people. We have 350 million people. And we're not that far behind China. US is next. So, but we're basically equal. So they have 1 billion people. We have 350 million. And yet, we're basically equal when it comes to our total carbon output. So what does that tell you? It tells that US is the world's leader in per capita. We're the leader in per capita emissions, meaning each as a per person. How much does each one of us emit? A lot more than the average Chinese person. So they need a billion people to reach our levels, and we do it at a, you know, a third of what they have. And so compared to Europeans, compared to Africans, compared to South Americans, we, the North Americans, produce much more carbon than anybody else in terms of per person. And so why is that? And, and I think one of the reasons we as a country, and then so now there's, a, uh, there's been global agreements to try and reduce global warming, that all of our countries should get together to solve them. And our country, America, was one of the few countries that never would sign this agreement. There was an agreement in Kyoto, Japan, where all the world's countries said, okay, let's reduce our emissions, let's make our cars have better mileage, let's have electric cars, let's have less uh, coal and all these things. And America was always the country that said, we're not signing that, we're not going to sign that agreement. And Australia was another country that wouldn't. And India signed it, and China signed it, and Russia signed it, and France signed it, and England signed it, and all these other countries signed it, so why not America? And a big reason is the Republican Party saying, we don't think there's such a thing as global warming. And, um, but I think part of the problem, too, is Americans ourselves, we realize if we were to admit that there's a problem and sign on to these global agreements, we as individuals would have to change our lifestyle a lot. Um, you all just said you drive here. Well, are you willing to give up your car and walk? Why didn't you walk here? It's too far. Why did you drive? In other words, I, what I'm trying to get at is the way that we organize ourselves socially, the way we lay out our cities and things, that's a big reason why we as individuals are such polluters. And we can't change that. I can't change Marysville so that the college, Yuba College, is closer to where everybody lives. Somebody some time ago, a long time ago, decided, let's put Yuba College way out on the end of Northfield Road. And there was no Edgewater back then. There was no other houses out here. It was way out on the edge of town, which is why it's called Edgewater. Um, but who put it way out there? Why not put it in downtown Marysville, which is where all the other buildings are? Why? I live in a place called Plumas Lake. Maybe I had some choice there. I didn't have to live there, but Plumas Lake is out in the middle of effing nowhere. In fact, that's what we call our neighborhood, the middle of effing nowhere. But anyway, um, you have to drive. If you want to go anywhere from Plumas Lake, you got to get in a car. So does that make me a bad guy? I mean, maybe. Maybe I should have chose to live right next to where I work and just walked here. But what I'm trying to get at is, if we put it all in terms of personal choice, what, do you, what are you going to do to save the planet? Then people say, well, it's not my fault, and I, I can't change that much, and I'm just trying to get to work, and I'm just trying to get some groceries, and I, it's not my job to save the planet. And if we put it up to individual people to save the planet, they're not going to want to do it, and they're not going to be able to. In other words, it's a sociological issue, not an individual issue. And so thinking about cities helps us see why we as Americans are such polluters compared to others. Choices were made in the history of our country and in the organization of our country that have affected how you and I live right now. And so our lifestyle isn't just a personal choice to be a car driver. It's also a social choice we made as a society to organize our cities in ways where cars basically are king in America. 
And so let's learn a little bit about cities. And really what I'm going to be focusing on is something called urban sprawl. Um, normally I would put up a picture of urban sprawl on the, uh, on the screen, but I don't have time for that right now. But what is urban sprawl? It's sprawling means to lay out flat. If you're sprawled out on the carpet, you're all like this on the carpet. Urban sprawl then is when cities spread out across the landscape. Instead of growing up into the sky, they grow out on the land. Can you think of a, a city that grows up into the sky? San Francisco. San Francisco is pretty compact. Can you think of another city that has a lot of tall buildings? Yeah. New York City is the king of very compact cities, really, uh, in this country anyway. Manhattan, that island, is just one part of New York, but there's something like 10 million people on Manhattan. And you can walk Manhattan. You could walk from one end of Manhattan to the other in a few hours. But can you think of a city in America that's not up in the air, but is spread out wide over the landscape? It's here in California. Huh? Well, Sacramento's getting that way. And I could show you a graphic I have that shows you all the mega cities. Los Angeles is the king of urban sprawl. Mexico City might be even more of a king of it. But in, Cal in the United States, LA is the city of urban sprawl. And so what is urban sprawl all about? Well, it has to do with, uh, and I'm going to talk about Los Angeles. So Los Angeles is uh, the king of sprawl. And if we were to take a look at a picture of Los Angeles, if you go out over, if you were to go out up by the Hollywood sign in Los Angeles and look out over the whole Los Angeles basin, it's called, you could see from like San Fernando Valley all the way down to almost San Diego. You could see this big area. And if you looked out over it, all you would see pretty much is humanity. In other words, you'd see a lot of concrete, a lot of houses, a lot of buildings, a lot of streets, a lot of freeways. What won't you see? Parks. Some parks, but what you won't see is big open space, big farmland, forests, huge lakes and waterways. It's all human creation for as far as you can see. Now, as you look out over the Sacramento Valley, if you go up into the hills over Sacramento, if you go up driving up Highway 20 up to Sacramento, up to Grass Valley, and you looked out over the Sacramento Valley, what would you see? You'd see a lot of human settlement, but you still see open space. You see a lot of farmland and uh, swampland and you know, uh, waterways and things like that, wetlands. So Sacramento Valley isn't quite totally sprawled out yet. But Los Angeles is what's known as a megalopolis. And that's one of your key terms from chapter 19. A megalopolis is a city of cities. We used to call them a metropolis. A big city was a metropolis, like where Superman lives. Isn't he from metropolis? And, uh, but a megalopolis is a city of many metropolises all stuck together. So when you said San Francisco was a compact city, maybe the actual city of San Francisco is. But really, San Francisco is part of what's called the Bay Area megalopolis. So Los Angeles is a megalopolis, but Bay Area is one too. And you could say that Bay Area megalopolis isn't just San Francisco. It includes San Francisco, Oakland, all the way down to San Jose, and even all the way out to here, Sacramento. Some people are including the whole Sacramento area now as part of this LA, of this Bay Area megalopolis. Why? Because there's people that live in Sacramento but work in San Francisco. And so it's all one community, really. It's all one big city. Now, Los Angeles is a city, back to Los Angeles. Well, we are talking about Los Angeles. How many cities? Well, really, we're talking about a five county area. So when I say Los Angeles, I'm not just talking about the city of Los Angeles. There is a county called Los Angeles County, and there's a city within it called the city of Los Angeles. But it wouldn't be accurate sociologically to just assume that that city of Los Angeles is one single place, because it isn't. It's all connected to a whole region that's a five county area, and people call it the LA region. And that's what it is. It's one place, but it's made up of 
Five counties. And how many cities do you think? Just take a wild guess. How many cities do you think are in the Los Angeles area? When we think of Los Angeles area, what are these five counties? Well, uh, well, Los Angeles County is one of them. That's the oldest of them. But Ventura County, um, Orange County, Riverside County, San Bernardino County, and I'm missing one, uh, Ventura County. So those are five counties that are all stuck together. Our area is also a five county. People routinely talk about the Sacramento area as Yolo County, Sacramento County, uh, Placer County, Yuba County, maybe Sutter County, El Dorado County, not so much Sutter, but El Dorado. And Yuba's usually included in there as one of the Sacramento area counties. So how many cities in the Los Angeles area? 200. 200 cities that are all kind of stuck together. And the way I like to think of it is, I don't know if you're into baking like I am. I'm not really that much into it. But do you ever make cookies? You ever make chocolate chip cookies? You ever make Christmas cookies? We've got cookie season coming up. Well, what happens if you're not very careful about where you put your cookies on your cookie sheet? If you don't space them out enough? You'll end up with one big, one big cookie. And that's kind of what happened with LA, is you had 200 separate little cookies growing up, and they grew and grew, and now you have one big cookie that isn't very tasty. It's the Los Angeles cookie, and I don't know if you want to live there and eat that cookie, but that's part of what we're trying to figure out here, up here in the Sacramento area. How do we not become like LA? Because as we're going to see, there's a lot of problems with this. And the report I'm drawing on is called When Sprawl Hits the Wall, because a group of researchers down in LA began to do research on, well, now we're reaching a limit of how much LA can sprawl. So why does LA end up with this big 200 city cookie. So let's talk first about uh, causes. How and why did Los Angeles begin to sprawl? And first point is that there was decentralized planning. And that's kind of the point I just made. LA wasn't really planned. 200 separate cities each were sort of planned. And as they were doing their own thing, they one day sort of woke up and realized, well, we're not just our own thing anymore. We're part of this big old thing called LA. And that's what I mean by decentralized. 200 separate cities were developed. But it wasn't all planned as one big thing. It was really what we could call developer-driven. The word developer has gotten quite important in the last few weeks, but a few months. What's a developer? Well, Donald Trump was a real estate developer, but what is a developer? What do they do? Just develop things. Well, what's their goal? I mean, do you ever play the game Monopoly? Who's ever played Monopoly in here? So what's the point of Monopoly? And why do you own the land? What do you do with the land? Huh? And so you develop it. You buy a piece of property, and then what do you do? First, you put some houses on it. And you get enough houses, you can put a hotel on it. And if you can put some hotels on it, your land can get really, really valuable. In other words, developers are people that buy land and then turn it into something and then try to make money off of it. So their goal is money. It's profit-driven. But if it's profit-driven, it's not necessarily driven by anything deeper than that. If your goal is money, then you're thinking, well, I'm going to do what's going to make me the most money the quickest possible. You're not trying to think of, how do I make a really great city? How do I make this a place that in 200 years will still be a great city? How do I make this a place where children will love to live? How do I make this a place where people will be really proud of the place and not want to hurt each other when they live there? Those are other kinds of questions you could ask when you were designing a place or trying to build a place for people to live and work and shop. Those are questions you could ask. But if your only question is, how can I make the most money possible as quickly as possible, then your choices about what to build and how to build it are going to be driven by that, not by larger questions. So for example, and here's a little extra credit opportunity that I'm a little hesitant to give you. But did you ever see the movie Chinatown? 
A lot of people today won't like it, but, it, but film critics, some people say this is the best movie ever made. I don't know if I agree with the critics that say it's the best movie ever made, but it's, it's, if you like good movies, it's a well-made movie. But it was made in the 1970s. I don't want to recommend that you go buy it. In fact, I would say if you could steal it or pirate it, you should watch it that way. Why do I say that? And I'm saying it on TV. Why? Because Roman Polanski, who directed this movie, is a convicted child molester who fled the country and lives in Switzerland and never served his time here. So I'm not saying you should go spend money on his movie. But it is a very well done movie. But what it really tells is the history of how L.A. developed. L.A. has a part of it called Chinatown, but that's not really what the movie's about. It's about how L.A. sprawled originally. And uh, the first place L.A. sprawled into is what's known as the Valley, the San Fernando Valley. And the valley, if you went there back when the explorers first got there, when the Spanish first you know, came to California, it's basically desert. If you were to go to the valley, it's cactuses and sand and aloe plants and things. It's not, uh, there's not a lot of water there. But now LA has something like 12 million people or something. Can 12 million people live in a desert with no water? How does that happen? And so how did it happen in, Ch in LA? Where did the water come from? They have water, but doesn't grow in the desert. So where did it come from? They drained a lake. No, it comes from up here. That's why California has big water wars all the time and we're still having them, still trying to figure out how can we take water from Northern California from Lake Oroville and other storage facilities up here down to LA. And so people are talking about, well, tunnels under the Delta or other kinds of things to bring water down. But we still, we always have brought water through the California aqueduct. So the California aqueduct takes water from Northern California down to Southern California. And it primarily does it to get the water to LA. And so how did LA develop? Well, some very wealthy, well-connected men uh, knew that the California aqueduct was being built. So they bought up a whole bunch of land in the desert. And people were wondering at the time, why are these guys buying desert land? It's valueless. What can you do with a bunch of desert? And they knew, well, the aqueduct's coming. And when the aqueduct comes and the water has, and there's water hookups in the desert, then we can build houses there. When you can build houses there, you can get really rich doing that. And so the, the LA's Valley was developed by people who wanted to get rich by bringing water from somewhere else to a place where water didn't exist. What they had was beaches. They knew people around the country like beaches. And if you could just have some water there, you could make it a very profitable place. And so that was why LA originally sprawled from where it was downtown LA. LA County is around the LA River. So there is LA River and there is water, but it's not a real big gushing river. But that's where the Indians lived that lived there before the Spanish got there. When the Spanish got there, that's where they built their missions and settlements was by the river. But when LA began to sprawl, it could only sprawl if there was water to get. And the water didn't come from LA, it came from other places and it was developers that made this happen and made the money off doing it. But like I'm saying, nowadays we're asking, was it smart to put that many millions of people in the middle of desert of California? Because now we're still saying, well, they're taking our water. And a lot of people up here don't like the idea that water that falls in rain and in our rivers up here gets diverted down there for their golf courses, their lawns. I mean, LA people live, a lot of them, like they're living with a lot of water. They have golf courses and lawns and other things. But um, so we have problems in California as a state because of this choice to make LA a very populated area at one time. So it wasn't done with long-term goals of making California a really healthy state where everybody had what they needed. It was done because these developers maybe saw a way to get rich real quick. And so that's one of the causes, but it's uh, one thing to have a scheme to get rich and another to have it actually work out. Like they say in the developing world, if you build it, they will come. Well, that's not always the case. Sometimes you build stuff and nobody comes and uses it and you don't make money. So how did it happen that people wanted to come to LA and buy things? And so suburbanization is a larger story we need to tell here. And suburbanization is something that happened throughout the United States around this time that we're talking about. So Chinatown, the movie, takes place in the 1940s. And the 1940s is when uh, 
suburbanization really got going in the United States. And uh, so what is suburbanization? If you don't know that term, the key to it is the word suburb. Suburb means suburban. So urban is a city. Suburban means you're living outside the city. You're living, uh, so uh, traditionally cities are places where people uh, live and work. You go, you live in a big apartment building and you work in a big office building and you go down the elevator in your apartment building and you take a cab to the office building or you take the subway and you work in the office building. And that's how a city like New York functions. It's an old style city, which is very compact. If you live in the city of New York, you probably don't want to own a car because to park a car costs as much as renting a house costs here. And you don't need your car because there's subways, there's buses, there's cabs, there's lots of ways to get around in New York City and you don't ever have to go that far. But in LA, you're gonna to need to have cars. Suburbs were these areas that began to develop outside of cities like New York that were mainly just residential, just housing, just single family homes that people owned. Not big apartment buildings that people are renting a space in, but single family homes on the land and outside the city. And those began to really develop in the 1950s and 60s. So the 40s are when it started, really, in America. It really got going. But the 1950s and 60s is when it really took off. And your textbook talks about this as well. It doesn't talk specifically about LA as much as I am. But it talks about some factors. And I'm going to talk about some factors that led to the growth of suburbs in America. One is economic factors for why suburbs grew. Um, if you recall earlier in this class, in the 1940s was when a World War II ended in 1945, and you had two million soldiers coming back from World War II. Two million people that the government had to figure out, how are we going to get these young guys settled down? How are we going to get them back from war and get out of the war mentality and more into a building the country mentality? And we also wanted to grow the middle class. So we needed a middle class, remember, in this country to help grow our capitalist consumer economy. And we needed a consumer economy. We needed people to buy stuff, buy things like you know, cars and couches and stuff like that. And so the growth of the suburbs was a pretty deliberate effort by the leaders of our country to say, if we can get more people to own their own homes, if people own their own homes, then what we will do is create a middle class. Because if you own a house, then you own something, you own a piece of the land, you uh, have an investment, you can grow wealthy on that investment. And if you own your own home, you're going to want to start buying things that go in your home and you can use your home as collateral to get loans to buy things that you might want for your home. And so the idea was getting people into their own homes is going to be a way to save capitalism as we talked about earlier in this class. And the more that people buy homes, the more they're going to buy other stuff like washing machines and refrigerators and swimming pools and lawn furniture and drapes and mattresses and all the things that people buy to put into their homes that help fuel our consumer economy. So the World War II was ending. We couldn't build bombs and weapons and ships anymore and put men to work being soldiers. Instead, you brought all those men back and there was something called the GI Bill. As we talked about earlier in this class, they gave a lot of these returning soldiers the money to buy a house. And they were encouraged to go buy a home in the suburbs. And the idea was if you go buy one of these new homes that are being built, and lots of new homes started getting built in the post-World War II period, in the late 40s, early 50s, and 60s, tons of homes got built in America. And lots of young people who were part of this baby boom generation, this new group of people forming families, these soldiers, um, all started having babies, and that's why it's called the baby boom. So people started getting born in 1946 and 47 and 48. And so all through from 1945 to 1964 is called the baby boom period because so many babies got born. And people were buying, ba <laughs> buying babies. They were having babies because they were buying homes, starting families, and buying cars and getting into the whole 
uh, sometimes it's called the cult of des domesticity, this idea that being a good American means having a little family, and raising a family, and driving around the country in your Chevrolet, and watching your TV in your living room, and um, this became a whole new lifestyle that was promoted in America, and it was promoted by the captains of industry that knew this is how we're going to build this society of the future. We're not going to do it with war, we're going to do it with people becoming consumers and enjoying what capitalism has to offer. But it's one thing to have a plan and say, well, let's get everyone to buy their own homes, it, but it's, uh, again, will they do it? So there had to be cultural factors as well that promoted this new lifestyle. It was a kind of new definition of the good life. When I say the good life, I mean, a successful life. How do you know if you've made it in America? People used to use that terminology. Oh, he's really made it. Well, what does it mean to make it and know that you've really arrived? How do you know when you're a success? And in the, the pre-World War II period, the definition of success was an urban one. In other words, it, anybody in here ever watch I Love Lucy? You know the show I Love Lucy? Can I use that as a reference? No, you don't know what I'm talking about? Well, that was one of the very first TV shows. Before, most Americans didn't have TVs in the 19, not until like 19, late, not until 1948, really, with the real TVs start to go into people's homes. And one of the first shows was I Love Lucy. And on that show, uh, the family that's depicted, they live in the big city. They live in New York City. They live on the top floor of a penthouse apartment. Every night, the husband, Ricky, goes and works in a, a nightclub. So he's like a glamorous music star in downtown New York City. And his wife, Lucy, you know, wishes she could be glamorous too. She wants to be in, in show business. But they live in the urban setting. They live in the city. And their success is an urban kind of success. But in the course of that show, actually, when they got married and had a baby, Ricky and Lucy, they moved to the suburbs. They moved to a single family home, not a big apartment building, out in you know, a more rural kind of area, suburban area. And a lot of TV shows after I Love Lucy began to be set in that kind of setting. Not in the big city with the flashing lights and the cars and the big tall buildings, but out in the suburbs with your neighbors. And so the new definition of success was not, I have the top floor apartment on Park Avenue in New York City, but I have my own house. And we're out here, and we don't need to go out every night. We've got a barbecue pit out back, and we've got a swimming pool, and we have our neighbors over every night for fun. We don't go out to the club or out to the fancy restaurant. We just have a more suburban lifestyle. So this became the kind of new vision in America that was depicted on TV shows and in movies and in books. It was all about not the big city anymore as the place where fun and excitement is to be had, but in the suburbs, in your own house, with your own backyard, with your own cars, and road trips, going on road trips in your car, and going camping with your family in your car with your little camper behind it. And so that became the kind of new vision that was promoted to Americans. And it was promoted, again, consciously. All these houses were getting built, and cars were getting made, and the idea was, well, let's promote this new lifestyle so Americans will want to buy those houses and those cars. And Southern California, by the way, Los Angeles was the kind of ideal of all of this. For one thing, Los Angeles is where these TV shows and movies got made. So Los Angeles was one place you could actually show this lifestyle. You could just take a camera out and show, you know, it's sunny in Southern California all year round. There's palm trees. And for people like my parents, they grew up on the East Coast with snow and rain and big cities and loud cities. And I was born in Chicago. That's where they were living. But when they got the opportunity, and this was in the late 60s when it was promoted, you don't want to live in the big city and the cold and the rain. You want to live in Southern California in your own house with your own backyard. And my dad was like into the idea I could wear sandals every day and just like hang out in the backyard. And they're like, yeah, it's California, man. And so... Um, so it was a new lifestyle that was being promoted. And so it's a, the culture changed. Instead of urban lifestyle being held up as the, the height of good life, uh, the ur suburban lifestyle did. And lots of people began moving out of cities and wanting to buy houses in places like Southern California. And so LA was kind of one of the 
first real big suburban areas, but a lot of other places began to follow suit. There were also some less pretty reasons why people wanted to move out of the cities. And these were what, what I'm going to call social factors. One of them is white flight. You can probably guess what white flight refers to. White people fleeing the cities and moving to the suburbs. And so some of the early suburbs the very, were very, at the first, mainly white. And Orange County is actually, even before San Fernando Valley in some ways, was one of the first suburban areas of LA. And Orange County, why is it called Orange County? What was there before it was filled with suburban homes? Oranges. So you had a bunch of orange groves in Orange County. And at this time in the 50s and 60s is when it was promoted the idea you don't have to live in the Midwest, in Chicago or Detroit. You can come and live in a city like uh, Orange County. And Orange County became, for many years, the whitest and most Republican county in all of the country. It's changed now. It's starting to become even more Latino than white. But back when it was one of the first suburbs in America, it was mainly, and now why were white people leaving places like New York City and Detroit and Chicago? Well, you had at the same time something called the Great Migration. African American people through most of our history in this country, lived in the South and lived rural lives. They were slaves that worked on plantations. And it was in the 20th century, really the mid-20th century, that large numbers of African Americans began to move from the southern rural states to more northern urban areas. And it was a massive migration. And World War II had a lot to do with it because World War II sent a lot of white, so white people to go fight in Europe. So two million white guys were fighting overseas. That meant there was huge labor shortages in the northern cities and we needed bombs built and ships built and guns made and so there were a bunch of jobs and the country you know, started saying to poor African American guys, well you're not allowed to fight in the war, we don't take black guys in the military but we'll hire you at the factory and it'll be a much better job than you ever had down in the south because down in the south you're a sharecropper making nothing you know trying to get by barely surviving but up here you'll be in a union you'll make really good money you'll ha you know have benefits and you'll be helping the country you know win a war against the Nazis against people that hate you even more than southern guys do and so in that sense, it was a very attractive thing. And many people moved north. Also a lot of Mexican people. This was also the period of the Bracero program where the US government said, we need more young guys to come work in the factories. And so large numbers of Mexican people were invited to the country. This was also the period when large numbers of Puerto Ricans, people that lived in the Caribbean that were Latino, began moving into the United States for job opportunities. So cities in the north that there used to be a lot of what are called white ethnics. The term white ethnics refers to people that are nowadays considered part of the white race, but when they first came to this country, like Italians, Irish, Polish, Jews, weren't really considered um, part of the white race. They were ethnic groups that weren't fully white. And they were among the ones that they sometimes were ghettoized in their own, own neighborhoods. Um, Chinatowns in the neighborhood where Chinese people had to live, but you had Little Italy in many cities, like San Francisco has a Little Italy, or it has North Beach, and New York City has a Little Italy. You had Germantown, you had places that were mainly Jewish and places that were mainly Polish. And so these were ethnic neighborhoods, white ethnic neighborhoods, but when the Great Migration happened and Puerto Ricans and black people and Mexican people began moving north, those neighborhoods began to have other people living there. And sometimes these white and ethnic groups would say, well, I guess it's not our neighborhood anymore. I guess this is becoming a Puerto Rican neighborhood. And if you ever saw like the movie um, West Side Story, a great musical that's based on Romeo and Juliet, well, that takes place in New York City and it's a fight between sort of Italian white guys and Puerto Rican guys. Those are the two gangs that beef with each other in that play. And anyway, that's set in the 1950s in New York City. 
And so a lot of these white ethnic groups, they were the ones that began to move to the suburbs, that had the chance to go buy their own house, and uh, their, you know, they were a lot of the times the ones that fought in World War II and stuff. More privileged white people didn't send their sons to go fight in the war. But, um, and so that's often who was attracted to go live in the suburbs. And so a lot of neighborhoods that had been Italian or German or Polish became more, um, you know, Mexican or African American or Puerto Rican during this time. And the suburbs began to fill up with white ethnic people. And so, so there were some social tensions there and conflicts that also helped explain the growth of suburbs. But for all these reasons, the suburbs grew. And your textbook mentions a couple of other things that I'm not mentioning here. So you should read the textbook chapter, chapter 19. But when they talk about suburbanization, they mention a few other things. They mention federal home loans, FHA loans, the Federal Housing Authority. And that's kind of what I'm talking about when I talk about economic reasons, trying to grow the middle class was the conscious effort of the federal government of saying, let's help people that can't really afford their own home. They're like white ethnic people that aren't rich. They're just working middle class people or working people that have apartments. They don't have a huge down payment to make on a house. But if we can give people a subsidized home loan, it's called subsidized, meaning the government helps pay for it. If you go get a loan from a bank, they're going to charge you, you know, some good interest and they're going to expect a big down payment and it, you might not be able to afford it if you don't have a bunch of money saved up already. But when the federal government said, we're going to help regular people buy homes, not just GIs like I mentioned, but other people were also encouraged to buy your own home. We want you to move out of an apartment. We want you to be a homeowner. And the federal government's going to help you do that by making sure your loans are affordable and your down payment is doable. And once people had that kind of help, they could buy their own homes, and they did. Your textbook also mentions the interstate freeway system. You couldn't have suburbs without a means to bring people from the suburbs to the city, and from each suburb to other suburbs. So the federal government really helped out these developers. It was developers that you know, built the homes and bought the land and built the homes. But they wouldn't have been able to make a profit if the federal government hadn't stepped in and built the freeways that connected cities to each other. And so that wasn't private industry paying for that. That was, um, that was uh, the federal government. And so, you know, developers, you know, I, I dwell on that point a little bit because, again, a guy like Donald Trump as a developer likes to say he himself made himself wealthy. Well, I don't agree with his point there. He, he didn't. But... Uh, it's also the case that developers depend on actions by taxpayers and by the government to make sure uh, that they're able to do the developments they can. I mean, developments are a social thing. It isn't just a private business that has no connection to a city. So, I mean, it's not accurate to say the government doesn't help business. It does. But anyway, um, uh, and actually here's another so Chinatown if you want to watch Chinatown I could give you some extra credit I warn you it's pretty uh, it's got some offensive stuff about it um, even relating to the issue of child molestation so if you're sensitive to those issues and R-rated movies you won't want to see it but if you want to see a movie some critics say is the best movie ever and if you want to write about it for this class I can give you extra credit another movie that I think you'll like a lot better and is also related to what I just talked about is Who Framed Roger Rabbit I will also give you extra credit if you want to go watch that movie. And that one you could watch with your family for the holidays. You might wonder, what does that have to do with what I'm talking about? Well, if you haven't seen the movie in, the while, in a while, it might not be obvious. But these freeways I'm talking about. Um, maybe I'll talk more about it later. But Los Angeles originally was not a suburban place. It was an urban place and it had really good public transportation. It had a subway system and it had a trolley car system. Nowadays LA doesn't have those things and if you ask, well where did the subway system in LA go? Where did the trolleys go? Um, it was developers and others that bought them up. Well actually it was a scandal. Not so much developers but General Motors, rubber companies and oil companies, standard oil and 
I uh, forget, uh, forget which tire company it was, a rubber company. Why would car companies, rubber companies, and oil companies get together and buy up the subway of LA? And then what they did with it, if you see the movie Who Framed Roger Rabbit, they, um, they got rid of it. They destroyed it. It was called the red car. So in LA, it, what I wanted you to pay attention to in Who, Who Framed Roger Rabbit is the red car, because there really was something called the red car in LA, and that was the name of their subway system. And you could get all over LA on the red car. And nowadays, you can't get around LA in a car, <laughs> in, a, in public transportation. You pretty much have to drive everywhere in LA. And that's one of the big problems with living in LA and why people don't like living there. And one of the big reasons why Americans are such polluters compared to the rest of the planet is we drive so much. And I'm trying to say to you, it's not just an inevitable thing that we drive so much. It was a choice made. So why would these car companies and tire companies and oil companies buy up public transportation and then rip it all out? What do you think they put in the place of the ripped up train tracks? Well, they put in freeways and they said to the federal government, you know, now you can put in the freeways. And why do they want the freeways? Because then people have to buy cars and have to buy tires and have to buy oil. And so it was a very deliberate and conscious effort by the car industry and the oil industry. Now, this is illegal. You're not allowed to get together with other companies <laughs> and buy out your competition and get rid of your competition so your companies can prosper. That's a violation of monopoly practices, antitrust practices. It's illegal. And these companies were brought into court. And they were found guilty of restraint of trade and illegal collusion and antitrust violations. And they were fined. Um, now keep in mind, turning LA into a car culture, and as we're going to talk about later, that has meant huge amounts of traffic jams, smog, really high asthma rates, cancer rates, all kinds of problems in LA. So lots of people have died and gotten sick and lots of problems caused because of all the cars in LA. So how much do you think these guys were fined in the 1950s for doing what they did? One dollar. So the federal government said, yeah, you guys are guilty, naughty, naughty. You shouldn't have done what you did. But the federal government basically said, we're glad you did what you did. In other words, you helped create the car culture of America. And not just LA, but the whole country is kind of dependent on cars. You pretty much have to own a car in the United States to get around. There's very few cities where you can just get to work and get home and do all the things you need to do without a car. And, uh, and so, uh, so the federal government didn't see it as a terrible crime back then. They saw it as illegal. Nowadays, though, 50 years later, we're looking back and asking, well, was it a great idea to put Yuba College like so far from where everyone lives? Is it a great idea to have us all be driving around in single vehicles that pollute a lot and cost us a lot of money? It's almost like we're addicted to oil. And then we have to you know, fight wars in places where they have oil so we can make sure we still can drink it and have it. And you know, uh, I think of it as like an addiction where we're worried that we won't be able to live the life we have if we don't have our oil. But meanwhile, in using it, we're causing a lot of problems for ourselves and for our children and for the planet. And so. In my mind, it was you know, a great crime that was committed. But again, at the time, it didn't seem like that. It seemed like, well, you found the key to building a great lifestyle for America, where Americans aren't tied down. They can drive all over. They can own their own houses. It seemed like a great achievement for individual freedom. But on the other hand, what does it mean for collective survival you know, as a planet? And so when we look at American lifestyle, if the whole world had it, if Chinese people drove as much as we did, if Europeans drove as much as we did, if Southern, South Americans did, um, the planet would be even way more polluted than it is, and it can't, it can't sustain that much pollution. So that's why people are saying our lifestyle isn't really sustainable. But what I'm trying to say to you is um, it's inaccurate to look at it as an individual choice you made to be a big you know, carbon emitter. It's a social choice. Our society made long ago, and if we want to fix it, we got to think it through. How could we reorganize cities and others so that they're in other places so that we're not doing it? But anyway, so LA built all these suburbs, and the rest of the country did as well. And uh, it began to change our lifestyle and make us much more mobile, but uh, also these other problems that I'm talking about. Um, so LA, like I said, has sprawled into 
different parts. It started out in, in downtown LA, that county, sprawled into Orange County, into San Fernando County, into San Bernardino County. Really, it spread into valleys because LA is really a series of valleys, and the first one was the LA Basin, but then it spreads in San Fernando Valley, San Gabriel Valley, Simi Valley, these other valleys. And nowadays, LA sprawl has hit the wall. That's the name of the report I'm drawing on. And to say that sprawl hits the wall is to say that there's nowhere left for LA to sprawl into. There's no more cheap land for developers to buy. They were buying cheap land, turning it into houses and whatever else, and got rich. And now there's no more cheap land available. No more undeveloped land in LA. The land that isn't developed is either owned by the federal government, like big Air Force land or Navy Air Station land, or some of it is Bureau of Land Management, which is like Indian land. And that's not easy for developers to get their hands on. So there's not much land left. So another factor, we're talking about factors in the growth of LA. Well, suburbanization ended a while back, but now you have in LA what are known as edge cities. Edge cities are when suburbs start becoming cities themselves. So originally what happens is a city begins building suburbs and people live in the suburbs, but they continue to work in the city. So a model for New York for a long time was people might live in Long Island in a pretty neighborhood with, you know, nice trees all around and single family houses and uh, nice leafy streets. But in the morning they would drive in or take the subway in to the city and go work there all day. Well, one problem is urban blight. Suburbanization can kind of lead to that. So I want to write suburbanization can lead to ur equals urban blight. What's urban blight? Well, that's when a city starts to fall apart. And what suburbanization does is it kind of erodes a city's tax base, is the way an urban analyst would put it. A city's tax base. What's your tax base? Your tax base is the people who live in your city. And they're the ones with money that make money and earn money and spend money. And if you have people earning and spending money in your city, the city is making money off that. Cities don't have income tax. If you know about income tax, you pay income tax to your federal government and you pay it to your state. But where does the mayor and the city council and the police department, how do cities get the money they need to survive? M much of it comes from sales tax from people buying and selling in your city. And so if your wealthiest people in your city leave, they go live in the suburbs, well then you don't have as many people in your city buying and selling and making money. And so the city is not making as much money as it used to. And if the city is not making as much money, it can't spend as much money as it used to on things like fixing your roads. And if you're not fixing your roads as much, what happens? You start having potholes. And you can't pay your sewer, you can't pay as many sewage workers. So your sewer starts breaking and you start getting sewage backed up and, you know, wow, fire hydrants bursting. And uh, if you're not paying for it, you might not be paying for enough sanitation workers. So sometimes the trash doesn't get picked up. And then on a windy day, trash flows all over the city. Now, these are co problems that cities sometimes face. Now, Marysville is a city that has seen its tax base erode and it can't always pay for the things it needs like enough police and enough firefighters and things like that. So when a city can't pay its bills, what happens? Well, the city starts to crumble. And if the city starts to crumble, it starts to have problems. And then the people who work there don't even want to work there. So for example, a common model might be a, a big company like General Motors might have a big office building, a big fancy office building in downtown New York and its top executives, the people that work on its top floors, probably live somewhere else in like Long Island or even New Jersey in a nice you know, house over there. And they take the subway or their car or even their helicopter into the city each day to go work in the big office building. 
But as the city begins to crumble, as the streets aren't repaired and there's sewage flowing in the streets and the crime rate starts to go up because there's not as many cops as there used to be and fires don't get put out as quickly as they used to because there's not as many firefighters. Well, now General Motors or whoever owns that corporate office building starts to say, well, maybe we don't want to even have our office building here because our top workers don't want to come into a city that the traffic is bad and the trash isn't collected. And when we invite like other businessmen from Japan to come meet with us and they come to the city and they're getting robbed in the streets and stuff, it doesn't make General Motors look good. So maybe we should move our corporate headquarters instead of having them in the city, let's move them out to the suburbs. That's where our top executives work and it's a lot cleaner out there and nicer out there. So let's just move our corporate offices out there to the city. So a lot of, to the suburbs. So a lot of suburbs that used to just be residential, just homes, have become cities in themselves. And uh, that happened in LA. So like in Orange County, Irvine was a little town in Orange County at one time. Irvine is now a full on city with a university and big skyscrapers and corporate headquarters. And nowadays in LA, it used to be every morning people woke up in Orange County and drove to downtown LA to go to work. Because downtown LA was where all the office buildings were and all the corporate headquarters. Nowadays, the commute actually goes in the opposite direction. There's more people waking up in downtown LA and driving out to Orange County to go to work because that's where the new office buildings and new high-tech factories and other kinds of things are going on. And so really, if you look at LA, the center of LA, the oldest part of it, Los Angeles County is kind of dead economically. And where the real economic activity is happening is on the edges of LA. So like Simi Valley is another high-tech area with lots of, you know, high-tech companies and factories for people to work in. And uh, uh, Ventura, I mean, I'm sorry, the, uh, where Magic Mountain is, Santa Clarita Valley, is another valley that has a lot of high-tech good jobs. And the city of industry out there. So it's the center of this big urban megalopolis, that's where people live, but there isn't as many jobs anymore as there used to be. And out on the edges that used to be suburbs where people just live, now that's where a lot of the jobs are. And so, um, so it's kind of the city has turned itself inside out. And the heart of the city is now on the edges rather than in the downtown. And I think you see some of the same thing in the Sacramento area. Um, originally places like Folsom and Roseville were suburbs of Sacramento. You would wake up in Roseville and you'd go work in Sacramento. Well, now Roseville has a lot of good jobs and high-tech companies like HP and stuff like that. And Folsom has good jobs. And there's probably more people waking up in downtown Sacramento and driving out to Folsom to go to work than the opposite. And so it's the edges of the Sacramento area that are a little more prosperous economically than maybe some parts of downtown Sacramento, or at least it's been that way for some time. Now, we're actually in a period right now where cities, again, are becoming popular places for investors to start building things. So like downtown Sacramento just had a new arena built. Um, the arena for the Kings used to be out in Natomas. Natomas was an edge city. If you wanted to go see the Kings play, you leave downtown Sacramento and you go out to Natomas. Well, that turns out to not work so well. That was sprawl. And the city of Sacramento is starting to see sprawl is not a good thing. Let's try to bring things more compact back to the city how it was. And so we'll talk more about Sacramento later. Sacramento has learned from LA's example that you don't want to end up like LA with a big sprawled out city. Um, it's, as we're going to talk about, got some problems. But you see some edge cities in this area too. And a lot of places in America, the old cities are the ones that aren't doing so well. Like Detroit is like a ghost town but more suburban areas that used to be just suburban might now have office buildings and factories and other kinds of work. And that helps sprawl the city out because the more that people go from the center of the city out to the edges, the more people are living a very sprawled out lifestyle rather than a compact one. And as we're gonna see, those edge cities are also where a lot of the shopping is. That's where you find your Costco's and your Best Buy's and your big box stores, they're called, big box stores. And a lot of days, a lot of times nowadays, that's where people wanna shop, so they're driving far distances to go to shopping. And I think you see that even in this area. Marysville, downtown Marysville, used to be the commercial center 
of life in this area. And if you wanted to go shopping or go have a nice meal, you go to downtown Marysville. Well, I don't know how many, how often you go shopping or go to dine in downtown Marysville now. But where do you go? Maybe you go to Yuba City and go to the box, big box stores out there and big you know chain restaurants out there. Um, you know that's where uh, that's where you might find Chili's or I don't know what else is out there. Uh, Red Robin and you know big in and out and that kind of stuff and that's where Kohl's is and other things like that so even Yuba City is, is more of an edge city to the downtown of Marysville even downtown Plumas Street was at one time more the commercial center of Yuba City and you even see there now they're trying to redevelop Plumas Lake so there's this uh, Plumas Street so there's this effort to kind of try to bring back the cities but um, anyway so that's how sub, sub, that's why LA sprawled was because of suburbanization and this growth of all these cookies and the growth of the edge cities and now you have this big urban area that's totally sprawled out and there's it can't grow anymore there's nowhere to go so that means sprawl has hit the wall and that leads us to our second point which is changing patterns of growth and development And um, I think the main thing I want to talk about here is population growth and demographic change. And I'm going to leave with this point here. So LA has continued to grow in terms of population. There's two ways for populations to grow, and chapter 19 talks about this. A natural population growth, that's when births outnumber deaths. If you got more people being born, you got more people being born than dying, then you're going to get an increase in population. But an artificial increase, or an artificial population growth, or sometimes it's called an artificial increase, that's when in migration, people moving into a place outnumbers births. Or actually outnumber deaths, really. And LA, for most of its period, grew artificially. In other words, people wanted to come from all over the country to live in southern, sunny Southern California. And again, my parents were an example, living in, growing up in New York, living in Chicago in their young adult years, and then seeing, wow, we can go live in California and never have to put on our snow clothes, never have to shovel our driveway, and own our own house and stuff like that. And um, so more people were moving into LA for many years than were moving out or were dying. And so you got, so in migration, outnumbers deaths and out migration. But nowadays in LA, there's actually more people moving out than moving in. And again, I was an example. Uh, that's where I lived before I lived up here, was in the Long Beach area. And for a variety of reasons, some of which had to do with sprawl, like the terrible pollution, the terrible traffic congestion, the social tensions in the town. For those kinds of reasons, my family was happy to leave and come up to Northern California. And, um, so lots of people are concluding that, that the sprawled out LA is not such a great place to live and people are moving. So nowadays, uh, out migration actually outnumbers in migration. That's now. And yet the population is still growing. Why is that? So LA continues to grow in population even though more people are moving out than moving in. What does that tell you? How is it growing now? It's growing naturally. So now births in LA are outnumbering the out migrations and the deaths. So you're getting a natural increase in LA and that's what accounts for the growth. But that means the nature of the population is changing. When we say demographic change, demography is the study of populations and their makeup. LA used to be primarily white and you had some Mexicans and some Asians and some black people. Nowadays, it's a majority-minority place, so no one group makes up the majority. White people are the, still the biggest group, but they're less than half. 
Mexicans are the fastest growing group, uh, Latinos, and they are almost to the point of white, almost the same size as whites nowadays. Asian population has tripled in LA since 1980. So I'm talking about from 1980 to, uh, 19, to 2000. And I'll come back on Wednesday and explain to you just how much the population has changed in that area. All right, we'll come back to LA and it's smog then.